I knew it. I knew it. See, when I, now the reason I did that is because if we can turn to 2 Corinthians, please. <laughs> Chapter 10. I, I, he told me that this morning. And as usual, and those of you that are visitors here, I love to take his jokes and completely butcher them in public. <laughs> It's a skill set that I have, and I do it quite regularly. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. We looked at this last week. I want to continue this uh, train of thought. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Paul, the apostle, writes, he says, The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. Last week, we looked at uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, and verse 2. Paul says to the Roman believers, these guys are Christians, they're following Jesus. And Paul says to them, he says, um, Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Now he's speaking to believers. He's speaking to people that were once in darkness, according to Colossians, were once walking in darkness, but God picked them up and placed them in the kingdom of light. He's speaking to people that once knew no hope and now have hope. He was speaking to people that were once alienated from the life of God and were now in the life of God, joined through Christ. He's speaking to people who are sitting in churches, who are saved, born again, and filled with the Spirit. But he says to them, don't be be conformed to the pattern of the world. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So just because you're born again, just because you are following Jesus, just because you are filled with the Spirit, doesn't mean that your mind has already been transformed and changed. How many of you know that you still have thought patterns and ways of dealing with life and ways of seeing the world that you still struggle with even though you're walking with Jesus? Even though you love God, you believe in the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ, but you still have thought patterns and ways of thinking and processing that you know don't push you towards the life of God, but they keep you from the life of God. Is there anyone else or is it just me? Okay, there's a handful of you. I appreciate that. So so Paul's writing to these people in in Corinth and he's saying that the weapons that we fight with, he said, they're not weapons of the world. He says, on the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So the weapons that God gives to us, the things that God, the, the assumption he's making here is he's saying to these Corinthians, you're born again, you're saved, but hey, guess what? You're in a battle. Amen? You are in a battle. There is a fight going on. You might not like that. You might not have chosen that. You might, be a, you might be a lover, not a fighter. Who's a lover, not a fighter here? Huh? Hey, huh? I'm a lover, not a fighter. Anyone? Okay. Some of we don't like that. But guess what? Lovers, not fighters. It doesn't matter. You didn't have a choice. When you came to faith, you entered a spiritual battle. Amen? And we have weapons in our disposal. And those weapons, he says, are not fleshly and carnal. He says, on the contrary, our weapons have divine power to demolish strongholds. And then he goes on. He says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. What are the strongholds he's talking about? He's talking about those arguments and those pretensions, those thoughts, all that stuff in our mind that sets itself up against a pure knowledge of God. A knowledge of how God sees you, of how God sees the world, of what God says is right and wrong. We have these things that come on in and invade our mind and attack us to pull us in a different direction. And so what he's saying here is that there's a battle going on that you're a part of. Most battles in the natural are fought over three things. It's either real estate, religion, or resource. Just about every war that's ever been fought was fought over one of those three things. It was real estate. We want a piece of land. It's not ours. We're going to take it. It's resource. We're fighting over oil or, or waterways uh, or whatever it is. Or it's religion. We're going we're gonna to get you to follow our way of thinking. And if you don't, we will, we will run you through with a sword or whatever. Most wars are fought over those three things in a battlefield out there. But Paul's saying as a believer, there's a war going on. And you've been conscripted whether you like it or not. And it's battles going on up here. It's, it's how you think. And just because you're sitting in church every Sunday doesn't mean you've won the battle. Amen? Doesn't mean you've won the battle. Most of us are not even aware of the battle. We come to faith and we give our life to Jesus. How many people do you know that they'll walk with God for a little bit and then two months, three months, six months, they turn away from God and then when you try to talk to them, they go, I've been there, done that, doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? What you mean is you weren't prepared to do your part of the work. You just want God to come in and do absolutely everything for you. Well, even I'm going to write a book called The New Testament for Dummies. Right? And it's going to state at the front, God doesn't do everything for you. You still have a part to play 
in the Christian life. You still got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And in, in connection to what we're talking about here, you have to work, do the work, the discipleship work of renewing your mind. God didn't pull my mind out and give me a whole new one. I had a computer once and it completely bit the dust, right? The hard drive frazzled and blah, blah, blah. And I took it to a computer guy. You know what he did? He just unscrewed the back, pulled out the hard drive, whacked in a new hard drive and bang, it was a new computer. Well, God didn't do that to my mind when I got saved. Praise God, he didn't cut the top of my head off, open it up, rip my brain out, put a new... I wish he had sometimes, but he doesn't work that way. He doesn't work that way. I've got to renew my mind. I've got to renew my mind. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3, Paul, the same writer, he writes to a group of, of believers in a place called Colossae, and he says this. He says, Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Why? Because you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. He's saying, since then, in other words, because this has happened, he's writing to Christians. You're a Christian. Here's what's happened. You're now uh, seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Some things have changed. You're not in the kingdom of darkness. He says, because of that, because that's happened, God has done that for you. Now you set your affections and your mind on things above and not just on things of this earth. Who does it? We do it. Set your mind. Set your mind. He doesn't say God has now set your mind and it'll be fine. You're sweet. Just travel along now. Everything that pops in there must be from God. Just accept it. Run with it. Go with it. He says, no, no, no. You've got to set your mind. There's still a little bit of work that we do in this process. And here's the good news. God never asks us to do something that he doesn't empower us to do. Amen? Is that right? God never asks his children to do something that's impossible for them to do. Way, way back, many years before Jesus came, there was an old prophet called Ezekiel. And Ezekiel chapter 36, I don't know if I put that one up there, I might not have. But in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26 and 27, Ezekiel speaking forward what we Christians would call prophesying, speaking into the future about when uh, the Holy Spirit came, he said, this is what's going to happen to people that, that decide to follow Jesus. He says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you, and I will move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws. I'll move you. In other words, I'm going to put my spirit in you, and everything I've called you to do, everything I've called you to live by as a believer, I can guarantee you this, I will give you a spiritual momentum towards that. Now, when I didn't have Jesus in my life, I could sin like that. I could go out and do whatever I wanted without a conscience. I didn't care. If it felt good, do it, right? Then I became a believer. And, and you know what I did just after I became a believer? Confession time, public confession. Time. Just after I gave my life to Jesus, I made a really, really dumb decision. I went out with some mates, had too much to drink, carried on like a pork chop. Police pulled me into the police station, fingerprinted me, all that jazz. I had to go to court. I fessed up. I was brutally honest. I said, yep, I did the deed. I'll, I'll cop whatever and so on. But you know what? I was doing the same thing two weeks before I came to Christ and I didn't care. All of a sudden, I felt so <laughs> convicted that I'd gone and done this really, really dumb thing. It's almost like before I came to Jesus, I had this momentum that pushed me towards the things that were against God. I didn't, it wasn't hard to do. It was easy. I was just flowing in that stream. Then when I came to faith and the Spirit of God comes in me, and, and in order to sin it, I almost like I had, to, I had to force myself to do the wrong things because the momentum had shifted in my life. It wasn't pushing me away from God. Now this Spirit in me, the momentum was pushing me towards God. I had this sense of spiritual momentum. And that's what Ezekiel's talking about. I'll put my spirit in you and I'll cause you to walk in my ways. It's not, you're not a robot. It doesn't say, I'm going to take control of you and make you do and say and think everything I want you to do. So you're not a robot, but he says, I'll give you. What I'll do is I'll put the car in first gear for you. What you do from there is up to you. But I'm going to put it in first gear and just give you that little bit of momentum. Anyone notice that since becoming a believer? Once upon a time, you might have got away with this and then you come to Christ and you go, I can still do that. But geez, it just doesn't feel right. And I feel like I'm, I'm actually working at that now. That came so naturally to me before. Now it's hard. Well, it's because as Ezekiel says, God's spirit's in you and he's causing you or he's moving you in the direction towards God, not away from God. Paul writes to the Roman believers. 
And he restates the importance of getting our minds set on the right things if we want the right fruit in our lives. He tells them that the way a person lives is a reflection of the way a person thinks. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 to 6. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. In other words, their mind is set here, and because of that, this is what life looks like. Because their minds, they already have their mind set. If you have your mind set on this, you say, well, then that's the direction your life is going to go. He says, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. There's so much written in the New Testament about our minds. There's so much written about what's going on up here and the battle that's taking place. And the trajectory of our most strongest thoughts is going to be the trajectory of your life. Your thoughts are going to take you somewhere. Remember last week? Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. Starts with a thought, ends with a destiny. It ends with a destiny. Your dominant thoughts are taking you somewhere, whether you like that place or not. And here's what a lot of people do. A lot of people look at that place and just fight hard. I don't want to... We used to, when we were in Youth with a Mission, we used to uh, uh, involved in discipleship training with young people. It was amazing how many young people would sit there in, in a session talk and they'd be going, I'm not, never going to be like my dad. I'm never going to be like my mother. I'm not going to be like that. I'm not going to be like that. But what happens is their whole life, their mind is set on what they don't want to be. Well, that's what their mind's focused on. You know what happens? They grow up and they end up becoming like that. Because that's where their mind is. That's where their focus is. They're thinking and focusing on what they don't want to be. Whatever you're looking at, you're going to hit. Amen? Whatever you're looking at is what you're going to hit. How do you know what your mind is set on? Have you ever stopped and thought about that? The Bible talks so much about the mind and the thoughts. Have you ever actually sat back and looked at your thoughts? See, this is what Paul's getting at in 2 Corinthians. Take every thought captive. Because when something's in captivity, when those three loaves of bread were in that cage... Rodney was able to sit back and look at him and all of a sudden go, hang on a second, that's just a loaf of white bread. That's just whole grain and that's just, what's that? What's that? You get a chance to look at those thoughts. You get a chance to make decisions about those thoughts. Do, is that really true? Do I really, want to be, do, do I really believe that? Is that really true about me? Is that really true about my wife? Is that really true about God? Is that really true about the church? Because sometimes they just come on in and we act on them and we just move with them and we don't grab a hold of them and we don't think about them. So how do you know what your mind is set on? Well, you you need to take an inventory of your dominant thoughts. Have you ever sat back and thought about what you're thinking about? Have you ever done that? Sat down and gone for a day. I'm going to think about what I'm thinking about. Because most of the time we don't think about what we're thinking about, we just think about what we're thinking about. (laughs) Instead of just thinking about what you're thinking about, why don't you think about what you're thinking about? Why don't you, well, if, if you were to sit down, if someone was to follow you for a day and they could see into your brain and, and see your thoughts, I wonder what at the end of the day would be the dominant type of thoughts that are going through that they're documenting. I wonder, I wonder how you would feel about yourself, truthfully. I wonder what they'd write down about how you feel about yourself. I wonder what they'd write down about how you feel about your life. I wonder what they would write down, your dominant thoughts about how you think God sees you. I wonder. If we could do a thought inventory, what occupies the real estate in your mind the most? Is it the things of God or the things of the world? Is it the vanishing riches this world offers or the treasures in heaven that moth and rust can't destroy? What's more dominant to you? Is it the truth as God sees it or is it the most popular opinion of current culture? What's your mind set on? What's your dominant thoughts? Remember this, your dominant thoughts are leading you to a destination. Whether you like that destination or not, they're going to take you somewhere. That's why we need to think about what we're thinking about. Uh, Numbers chapter 13, we mentioned this last week, but I want to have a bit of a look at this. This will give us a bit of a picture of kind of what I'm talking about here. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 27 to 33, we've got the picture of the children of Israel. Now, you all remember the story. The children of Israel are in Egypt. Moses comes, and God uses Moses, and the children of Israel are set free, and there's all these miracles and, and, and stuff that these children of Israel would have been sitting there going, my goodness, this is amazing, because for 430 years, we've been slaves, and we felt like God didn't 
didn't care for us. We felt like God was distant from us. And then all of a sudden, water's turned into blood. Frogs are popping around everywhere. Firstborn are dying and everything like that. And they're completely blessed and nothing's happening to them. In the end, this guy that has kept them captive and is abusing them and mistreating them ends up going to Moses. Okay, dude, you can take them. Two million of them, you can take them. Not only did they walk out of, of Egypt, but they walked on their neighbor's door and said, give me all your golden trinkets and all the goody goodies. And they took all the goody goodies with them and they walked out. They walked out. As Pharaoh sat there sobbing on the balcony, they walked out. Then, of course, Pharaoh has this change of heart. So he gets his armies together and goes, We're gonna, what have we done? This was ludicrous. Let's go and get them. So Pharaoh and his army start charging after them. They get to, the Israelites get to the edge of the sea and God parts the waters and the children of Israel walk across on dry ground. And they turn around as the Egyptians are following them. Then the water closes over and the enemies of Israel are defeated and gone. And they're standing on the other side. Like, this is pretty amazing. Most of us in this room would love to see something like that in our lifetime. Amen? And if you saw something like that, you would never doubt the reality of God's love, would you? Hmm? Would you? Can't tell you the amount of people I talk to, if I only saw a miracle, I don't think that would change anything, really. If I, if I just had what you had, or if I just heard that, or if, if I just saw it, there are, there are millions of people around the world who have seen and heard, and, but they still don't walk daily with Jesus. It's a choice every day, isn't it? Wake up and to walk in the truth that we know. I could, if Jesus never did another thing for me for the rest of my life, what he did on that cross 2,000 years ago is enough for me to follow him for the rest of my days. Amen? Dying on that cross, taking upon himself that which I deserve so that I never have to face that. I never have to stand before God and be separated from God and be judged for all my yuck because of what Jesus did. If that was it. But praise God, it's not just that. God continues to bless us. So here we are, they're over there, and they're getting ready to go into the promised land. Remember, God has spoken to them, and God says to Moses, go and tell, I want you to get 12 spies, tell them to go and look at the land I am giving you. Everyone repeat back to me, I am giving you. Right, not, not go and have a look at the land and tell me if you think you can take it. He's very deliberate. He says, go and have a look at the land I am giving you. In other words, it's already yours. It's like, I just bought you, I just went and bought you a new Lexus. You don't know this, Owen. I bought you a Lexus, okay? Now, at the end of the service today, I want you to drive down to, I wouldn't even know where you buy a Lexus, but I want you to drive down to those Lexus buying places and just, just tell them, I'm Owen here, I'm just here to go and see the, like, 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 there's no pressure on you. You're, gonna, you're just going to have a look at what, what's already yours, right? And this is what God said, go and have a look at the land that I am giving you. I'm going to give this to you. So 12 spies go in and they come back. Now, let's have a look at the response. They came back and it says in verse 27, they gave Moses this account. We went into the land which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's its fruit. But, 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 but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country. These, these nations, by the way, were, were warrior nations and, and pretty powerful people. So understandably, when you're throwing those sorts of names out, uh, it'd be like, you know, Owen, um, Rocky Balboa's coming to your door and Arnold Schwarzenegger's coming to your door and, you know, they're, they're, you're going you're gonna to kick them out, all right? You're going to kick them out, right? Good luck. And he goes on, he lists these nations, the Amorites, they live in the hill country. The Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. And then Caleb silenced the people before Moses. So Caleb is silencing them because when they're hearing all this stuff, what are they doing? Oh, end them. Oh, end them. Oh, no. So they're starting to murmur and complain. Again, don't, don't be mad at them. I would do the same thing and so would you. We would do the exact same thing. But Caleb, it says, quieted them. He silenced the people before Moses. He said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him, catch this, they said, we can't. We can't. We can't. I mean, God's already told us that's our land. We, 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 a couple of days ago, two weeks ago, we were in Egypt. I was lugging stones around building Pharaoh's properties. And then God came in, and we saw frogs and blood and firstborn die and all this sort of stuff, and... Then we grabbed all the trinkets and we walked out. We walked out. The front gate, by the way, we didn't sneak out. The front gate. I saw Pharaoh sobbing on the balcony like he couldn't do anything about it. Then we got to the edge of the water. The water parted. How many people have walked on dry ground other than a low tide? 
Not many. We walk straight through, smack bang in the middle of it. Coming out the other end, turned around, watched that go down. We've just seen all that. And God said we can have this land, but we can't. <laughs> we can't. They said we can't. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they'd explored. They said this, the land we explored devours those living in it. Now, hang on a second. A second ago, they were huge warriors, tough and strong. And now the land devours its inhabitants. But the inhabitants that are in there, they're not devoured because they're strong, big warrior type people that we should be afraid of. But the land devours its inhabitants, except for the inhabitants that inhabit it. It doesn't make a lot of sense, does it, really? You know? Again, sometimes it's good to grab your thoughts and have a think. Grab your thoughts and think about what you're thinking about. Because that doesn't make sense. If I was there, I would have put my hand up and gone, I've just got a question. <laughs> if it inhabits, if it devours its inhabitants, then how come its inhabitants are not devoured? That would be my first question, but I wasn't there. And the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak that come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. The ten spies said we look like grasshoppers to them. But before that, they said we look like grasshoppers in whose eyes? Ours. The problem here had nothing to do with the nations that were in the land. The problem here had nothing to do with a good God that gave them a promise and gave them a destiny and a future. The problem here was what? How they were seeing themselves. What's going on up here, boys? Now, here's the thing. If you were a slave for 430 years... you'd probably think the same. It's amazing how the, the way we live. Before I came to faith, for 19 years, set me up for patterns of thinking, ways of seeing things. And the day I gave myself to Jesus, they didn't all just change. I had access to information that was different, but for some reason, some of this stuff is still there. It hangs on, and it hangs on, and it hangs on. Until one day, we decide to take those thoughts captive, and we bring them into the obedience of Christ. We look at them, and we go, hang on a second. Is that what God says? Is that what God thinks? I'm a new creation. I'm not that old creation. I'm a new creation now. Is, is, is this how this creation should be thinking? Is this what God would say? So the real issue had nothing to do with what was going on outside of them. It had everything to do with what was going on inside their own minds. But go easy on them. 430 years of slavery. These very same people that are standing there about to go into the promised land have never known freedom in their whole life. I wonder how many thought patterns and things you have from your own background, your own childhood, the way you were brought up. And we come to faith, but we know something's still holding me back from really embracing everything God has for me. I wonder if we've ever stopped and gone, well, maybe a lot of that's up here. Because the way we think leads us. We act on our dominant thoughts in life. The thoughts that we sow, the thoughts that we allow in, that we fertilize. Remember last week, about 60,000 thoughts a day are gonna come into your brain. You think about 60,000 thoughts. The average person thinks about 60,000 thoughts a day. They're not all bad, but they're not all God. And some of them are going to wanna to pull you towards God and the life God has for you. Some of them are gonna pull you away from that. 60,000 thoughts. And we've gotta take those thoughts captive. Because if we're going to seed those thoughts, we want to know we're seeding the right thoughts. If we're going to water and fertilize those thoughts, I want to know that they're the right thoughts. I want to know that they're thoughts that line up with what God has for me and who God says I am and who God says that he is. So what about you? What lies from the past do you continue to water and fertilize? In grade seven of high school, I, my mother was a bit of a gypsy. I lived with my mum at this point. My parents were separated and I spent a bit of time here, there. I was living with my mother and my mum was a gypsy, right? Not, not a gypsy with a turban and a horse and cart. That would look weird in Australia. But she moved around all the time. and She would just grab me off a school bus and say, Al, jump in this uh, car. We're just going to go and visit a friend. And then we'd visit that friend and never come back. 
And then I'd be at school for six weeks at a new school, and then she'd go, oh, we, I'm, let's, let's, we're just going to go and visit another friend of mine, we'd go. And so, so I, got, I went from being, when I was in sort of grade, kindy through to grade six, I was the kid that loved learning. Uh, I, I, got, I was always top two at English or maths when they had the little palm card races, you know, with the little kids, like, two plus two, and something goes, oh! And I was always like in the top two of all that sort of stuff, you know? But then in grade seven, something happened. I went to seven high schools in that one year, shifted around. I'd go to one school, and I'd, I'd go into a class, and uh, they would be a little bit further on, and there's a gap in the education, so I felt like I'm trying to catch up to, to get there. Then you go to another school, and they're learning something totally different that we hadn't learned before, and so on. Not only that, but I would go to a place, and I would make a friend, and then my mother would chuck me in a car and drive me away. I never, ever got to say to that friend, hey, goodbye, I won't see you again. I didn't know. So what ended up happening was, after a while, I adopted a couple of ideas, mentalities. Number one was that, that there's no point making friends, no point being friendly with anybody, because what's the point of relationships? Relationships are a waste of time. All they are is a source of pain. And the other thing I adopted was this mentality that, because I couldn't keep up at school, I just threw it in and thought, well, what's the point? And from that point on, I failed every year and failed just about every subject. I went through, I, I stayed through to year 12, all the way through to year 12, and I failed the HSC. My mark was so low that they had a rule at that time that once you got to a certain point, they didn't tell any student anything under that. We all just got this one number, and I got the one number, so I don't even know how bad I went. I convinced myself these two things. One day, after getting saved, born again, I'm in Brisbane, I'm sitting down with a great man of God, he took me under his wing for a bit, discipling me. And I'm sitting down with him one day and we're talking uh, uh, about that and I'm talking about my education and, and I had adopted this idea, I'm, I must be kind of stupid and dumb, I'm not very smart, you know, education-wise and so on. And then we're sitting there talking and I'm sharing this story about having to, you know, being picked up and taken everywhere and this place and that place and then I, I said to him how, you know, I, I just adopted this mentality where I, you know, just quit trying to learn. And he stopped me and he said, so you're not stupid. It's like he grabbed that thought and he took it captive and he made me look at it. I said, what? He said, you're not stupid. I said, no, well, I'm, I'm not really smart. He said, no, no, stop. He said, you're not stupid. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you just told me. You're not stupid. You just gave up on learning. Very big difference. Very big difference. You're not stupid, Alan. You just gave up on learning. And it was such a clear, vivid moment in my life of somebody helping me take a thought captive. And I sat back and I looked at it. And I thought about, where did that actually come from? How true is that? How real is that? And for all those years prior to that, I had lived with a belief, a negative belief that I was stupid and dumb. So anything to do with learning, education, getting smarter, knowledge, I steered clear of it to the point where I wagged school every time there was a test. I wagged school every time there was some kind of upfront thing where you had to you know, speak and, and, and people got a chance to see how smart or not smart you were. I, I, I just didn't go to school. I had long periods of time where I just dipped out of my education. I didn't care about any of that stuff. All because of, now who knows, I could be a brain scientist today. Honestly, I could, be in, I could be operating on you one day if it wasn't for that one thing, that one mentality, that one thought I adopted, and it made me think, I wonder how many other people out there have adopted thoughts like that, things that you've allowed to come into your mind, that you've watered and fertilised, whether you realise it or not, and they're stopping you from being the person God created you to be. They're stopping you stepping out and trusting God in the areas you need to trust Him, all because of a thought, something up in your mind where this battle rages that you've hung on to, fertilised and watered because you've never ever taken that thought captive and looked at it and brought it under the obedience and reality of Jesus. I wonder how many of us are missing out on intimacy with God. How many of us are missing out on testimonies and miracles because we've been convinced that we can't trust God. Yeah, yes, Jesus died for me. Yes, he was resurrected. Yes, I'm born again. I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. I know that, but God wouldn't do that for me. I know that, I know that I'm born again. When I die, I'm going to go to heaven but I don't really think Jesus likes me that much down here right now. But he'll let me into heaven, but if only. I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm your brother. I know I'm your sister because we're all saved by Jesus, but I'm not going to put myself out there and get to know you because you wouldn't like me. Because I'm just, no one likes me. How many lies have we fertilized and watered that we believe that are holding us back? And they're just simply not true. Neuroscience, which is a fairly new science, neuroscience has shown that exposure to something long enough and then you start acting it out, it creates neural pathways in our brain that become natural and normal for us. So things that you do right now naturally and normally, ever been driving along in a car 
and your brain kind of checks out and you're thinking about things, then you snap back in, you think, oh, who was driving? You ever done that? Yeah, you know why? Because you've got a neural pathway in your brain, so you drive naturally and normally now, and even if your brain checks out, you, you know what you're doing, you've done it so often, there's this natural pathway in your brain, so you, you just did it anyway. When you snap back, you panicked, I've done that, you panic going, jeez, how'd that happen? Praise you, Jesus. For a miracle, angels must have had the wheel. Well, kind of, it was God. He created the brain. He created it in such a way, when you do something enough, you create these pathways in your brain. A little bit like the dog in the backyard. You've got the backyard there, and the dog runs from that side of the fence to that, to that, to that. The rest of the grass is 12 feet high, but there's this path that's just been worn. Why? Because he just keeps on running in the exact same patch of grass. That's what happens with our brain. That's what happens with our brain. When we keep believing things and acting on them, we develop these neural pathways. The brain's an amazing thing. Neuroscience has found that our brain is, is it, it's so plastic that at no point in life, at no point in life can you stop shaping your brain. It's true. We, we go, oh, once people get to a certain point in life, your habits are set and who you are and so on. Well, neuroscience is finding that that's actually not true. I've started brushing my, my, my teeth with my right hand. You know why? Because it's different, and I've never done it before. My whole life, I didn't realize it. I'm, I'm reading this book about it, and I thought, yeah, that's so true. There are just things that we do. And they're saying one of the good things for the brain, especially for older people they're getting a bit older, is to do things a little bit different. Is, is just do things a little bit different because it's really good for your brain. Stimulates your brain. What does it do? It creates more neural pathways and fires your brain off and so on. So if you have habits and things that you don't, don't like and that you want to break, it is possible to break them. Don't ever believe that you can't. Change the inputs, start believing the right stuff, and then you'll start acting out the right stuff, and you can literally rewire those parts of your brain. Research shows that the way you get someone to believe a lie is simply repeat the lie over and over. That's all you've got to do, just keep saying it to them. Eventually, people believe it. They've even got a name for it. It's called the illusory truth effect. The illusory truth effect. Repeat a lie enough to a person, they'll start believing it, and they'll start acting it out. Now, that's actually good news. That's good news, because it tells me if you can replace that lie with the truth, and you can keep repeating that truth over and over and over and over, and you can keep speaking truth to yourself, praise, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. He's speaking to himself. It's not a dumb idea. It's pretty good. People have done it for years. So if you can take the truth and start speaking that truth into yourself over and over and over and start acting out that truth, guess what happens in your brain? You create new paths, neural pathways in your brain. And before you know it, that thing that feels awkward and hard and unnatural becomes more and more natural until it becomes the default and it replaces the old. Here's what I love about the Word of God. Science is so far behind. It's so far behind Jesus. It's so far behind God, isn't it? I, I read this the other day and you know what I thought straight away? My brain went to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. To the Jews who believed him, Jesus, look at this, to the Jews who believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you're my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. Now keep in mind, the word know in the Greek, New Testament word know, is not about just information, it's also about experience. It's experiential knowledge, right? It's knowledge that we know and experience. It goes in and it becomes a part of our life. He says, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So truth doesn't set you free, what? Until you know it. Truth doesn't set you free until you know it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say faith came when I heard the word of God. Faith comes and it comes and it comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. What am I doing? I'm rewiring some things up there. And guess what? God made the brain so he knows that's how it works. He's very smart, God. He's very smart. Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him, if you hold to my teachings, you're my disciples, you'll know the truth, truth will set you free. That word hold to, that, that Greek word hold to, literally means to abide in, to remain in, to dwell in, to continue in. In other words, to stay there and don't depart. What's he saying? Go there and go there again 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 and go there again. Get it inside of you. Hear the word of God, hear the word of God, hear the word of God. Tell yourself, tell yourself, tell yourself again. Hear the word of God, hear the word of God. Before you know it, you're starting to live it out. You're starting to slowly believe it. Then you fully believe it. Then you're living it out. And you've got these neural pathways going in your brain. And you're starting to walk in all the things that God has for you. Don't think it's kooky. It's not new age. It's science. And God created science. Amen? God created science. Hold to, abide in my word, why my word is truth. Abide in my truth, and what's going to happen? That truth is going to what's going to set you free. Where's it going to set you free? Up here. 
And when you're set free up here, you'll be able to replace those thoughts and those limiting things that are keeping you from the life of God. You'll replace them with the truth of God's word. And before you know it, your, your life begins to get that momentum again and you're flowing in the direction of God. I'll finish with this. I'll finish with this because we've got to go. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 to 11. This is why that story about the children of Israel, in my opinion, is probably the saddest story in the history of, human, of the human race. It's the saddest story. Two million people. Because of that negative report, you know what happened? Ten of those spies, the majority came back with a negative report. Two million people and those ten, guess what? They didn't get into the promised land. It was just over there. Their kids grew up. They marched around for 40 years and the next generation got to go in. They missed out. They came back and said, they're too big. We can't. We this, we that. Keep that in mind. This was their declaration. This is what they said. We can't. They're too powerful. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. Blah, blah, blah. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 to 11, Joshua learns from that experience. I wonder if it, wonder if it was, instead of sending 12 spies, Joshua sends two. <laughs> Moses is dead. Joshua takes the reins. He says, well, I'll just send two. At least that gives me a 50-50 chance because I don't want to go marching around for another 40 years. So he sends two spies into the land and they go into Jericho. And in verse 8 to 11, ah, oh, how sad. Before the spies lay down for the night, she went up, this is Rahab, went up onto the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land. I know the Lord's given you this land. She's, she's living in the land. She's one of those people. These people are going, man, they, they, these guys are going to kill us. She says, man, we know. I know the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on all of us. For 40 years, they've been shaken in their shoes, just waiting for these people to step across the threshold and claim what God had given to them. These great giants, the ones that they were afraid of were over here afraid of them. The only difference is they had God. These guys didn't. It says, we've been waiting here and a great fear has fallen on us so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Wow. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt all those years ago. And we heard what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan. We heard all this stuff. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above all on the earth below. Can you imagine it? For 40 years, they're wandering around in a desert because they believed the lie. They believed a lie. And two million people, they sowed a thought and they reaped a destiny. What are your dominant thoughts? What do you believe about yourself? I think it's about time. Back in the 70s, it was all about physical health, wasn't it? Jazzercise and all that stuff. Anyone get into that stuff? And aerobics, DVDs, and, or VHSs back in those days. It's all about physical health. Now, how many of you know the tide's turned and we're physically pretty healthy? But what are we worried about now? It's mental health. Now it's all about mental health. It's funny, you can track on a graph about the same time, social media and all this information we had access to on the internet, you can track it on a graph. As that began to go up, mental health began to come down. What's the correlation? It's information. It's voices. It's perspectives. It's opinions. It's all this extra stuff we're trying to process. And all these thoughts are pulling us in different directions. And we need to learn the skill of taking every thought captive and bringing it into the obedience of Christ. And if it doesn't line up with who God says I am, it's not true. If it doesn't line up in what God says about his church, it ain't true. If it doesn't line up with what God says about himself, it's not true. If it doesn't line up about what God says about um, relationships, it's not true. If it doesn't line up with what God says about finance, it's not true. If it doesn't line up with what God says about, about him providing, about him caring, about him being with us, then it is not true. It is not true. And what better place to start a mental health re revolution and in the church of God. Amen? Because he was a few steps ahead of science. So, Father, we want to thank you for your word this morning, God. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for uh, Lord being present with us. And God, again, it's one thing to sit here. It's one thing to look at a couple of passages. It's one thing to talk about this stuff. Father, the real rubber meets the road when we get up. We walk out of here and we make the decision to do it. And so, Father, I pray this morning for each of us in this room, Lord, as we leave this place, that, God, we would be doers of the word, not hearers only and living a self-deceptive life, God. 
Father, we want to walk in all that you have for us, God. And if there are limiting thoughts, God, if there are things that we are fertilizing and things that we are watering and things that we are believing, God, about ourselves, about you, about the world around us that do not line up with you. Father, I pray would you begin to expose those things in people's minds. Would you begin to point those things out, God? Would you teach us how to take those thoughts captive, how to sit back and to look at them, to examine them, and to see those thoughts for what they really are? Lies and not the truth of God. So, Father, we just give you this uh, uh, time that we've had this morning. God, I pray as we leave this place for the next seven days, I pray, Lord, would you give us a chance to tell somebody about the goodness of God. Lord, we we are going to go to work and school and all sorts of places where so many people don't know the reality of Jesus. And I just pray, would you give each of us in this room the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with somebody out there that doesn't know it. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. 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 God bless you guys. Hey.